so my name my name is Nell Madigan and I'm the Associate Dean for the School of Labor and Employment Relations on campus and we are a graduate only program um, for folks who are interested in employment relations whether that be from the labor side or from the company HR side or if you're entrepreneurial and you think you may want to figure out how to manage people who are um, working for you. I apologize in advance. My dog is also in the yard and she's about to bark her head off because the neighbor dog is coming by. Um, so I've been doing this for a number of years and um, the presentation that I've put together today is focused on personal branding in terms of securing um, gainful employment, hopefully at the end of your <laughs> time at school. Um, I will turn it over to Brian and allow him to introduce himself as well. But if you have questions about this or about our grad program, once we're done talking, um, you can certainly look us up in the university directory or on LinkedIn and either of us would be happy to talk to you. Yep. So my name is Brian Neighbors. I'm the Associate Director for Career and Student Services in LAR. So I work with Nell on all of our employee relations, or the career development that we do with our students to help them find internships and jobs. But I also work with our assistant dean of student services. So any prospective students are welcome to reach out to me. I help them schedule visits to the program. I connect them with current students. We talk about the application process and the LER. So anything from when you're thinking about LER to that full-time job, I kind of have a, have a hand in in the program. So Definitely any, any questions you have, feel free to, to reach out to me and ask. So this is about to get interesting because my dog has cornered a snake on my patio here. <laughs> so I apologize when things <laughs> get out of control here in a moment. Um, hopefully she doesn't get a hold of it. We're fingers crossed on our side. Um, anyway, so uh, there she is. Um, so today I'd like to talk to you guys about the things you should be thinking about to be sure that you're on brand and putting forth the right brand when you're um, in the recruiting process. And I think everybody, when you say get ready for your job search, um, you know, work on your job search, um, you think about having your resume, you think about your interviewing skills, but you really have to think about the whole package. Um, and, you know, all the things that go into that. And it could be the things, especially now, like how, how can you work? How, you know, what, what kind of office atmosphere do you like? Are you able to work remotely? Does it make sense for you? It, you know, Brian and I are both remote today, but once the students are back, we really need to be there um, to, to be supported. So what types of things do you like to do? What do you bring to the table? And so what I talk about today is gonna to be a little bit about thinking about your brand and then um, some tips for putting that into practice with the various um, pieces of your job search. Oh, and the snake is loose. There we go. The dog is still chasing it. This could get really exciting on today's. Uh... <laughs> Um, we have a stone house, as you've probably noticed behind me. So snakes like to like burrow around the foundation because it's warm when the sun comes out and the dog is just baffled by this whole thing. Anyway, so if you think about your brand at work or, or for those of you that are students, I think we have a little bit of a mix today. There are all these things that you can think about that are um, straight a, you know, out of um, if you took you know, a marketing and branding class while you were on campus. So if you think about it, even when you're in class, thinking about, you know, how you're packaging yourself, how you appear in class, and that doesn't mean dress up every day, but even when you're online, you know, show up, um, have your camera on, um, you know, <laughs> comb your hair, whatever that might be. I think the big joke is, you know, are we all wearing, you know, pants when we're online, that sort of thing. But you know, appropriate engagement um, and so that they know how to reach or they know what to expect when they reach out to you. Um, thinking about your messages and values, thinking about the quality of your interactions with peers and, and your team, and then what you bring to the table that's unique. So I always tell our students, um, you know, it's a fairly small program. We've got about 80 students coming in in the fall and, um, you know, in a, in a lot of ways, they're very homogenous. Um, 
you know, they've had good undergrad experiences. A lot of them are psychology or business, but not all of them are. And a lot of them have had different experiences coming in. So what are those unique experiences that they can bring forward to an employer to set themselves apart? And then when you're thinking about your own advertising and exposure, where, you know, where are you a member? Um, who are your mentors? Where are you getting exposure with leaders in the area? And I know we probably have business and engineering interns that are here today. Since I'm screen sharing, I can't really see. Um, but thinking about where you are around campus. So if you wanted a job like the job that Brian or I had, um, you know, what are you doing to get involved with the right groups um, straight out of the gate so that when you go for a career services job later, you're known within the community. So those are the things you should be thinking about. And if you think about, you know, what makes a brand great, these are all old school brands, but I'm kind of an old school person. And if you think about this, you know, they're recognized brands, they're quality brands, they're strong, but in each of these situations, they, you know, they, they have reach, you know, sometimes across industries um, and markets for sure, but they're willing to take risks. And I think if you build your brand strongly enough, you should be able to take reasonable risks um, and still be successful. So just looking at this, if you think about um, uh, Pepsi way back in the day, and you know, who knows who's old enough to remember this one, Pepsi um, tried Pepsi Clear. And it was gross, right? Because it tasted like Pepsi, but it looked like Seven Up, and it just wasn't what you expected. It's kind of like green ketchup; it doesn't do it for everybody. But because Pepsi is such an established brand, they were able to take a calculated risk. It didn't work. That's great. They, you know, they dialed that back. Kind of like when Coca-Cola tried New Coke and then went back to the classic Coke. It's just, you know, you can take calculated risks with your brand and try new things, um, but you should have a strong base to fall back on. So that's something else to think about. And, you know, looking at GE, um, GE is a company that has um, not as many businesses now as they did, but if you think about when 9-11 happened, they had a new CEO and he watched on their television station, they, they owned NBC at the time, as planes powered by their engines, and they still do have um, a, a GE aircraft is one of their businesses, crashed into buildings that were financed by GE Finance. And that's a pretty big brand reach. So I think that the goal is not um, to be part of a television station or to finance skyscrapers, but it, my point is, you know, the bigger reach that your brand has and the stronger that it is, the more you're able to come back from um, unexpected situations, we should say. Um, so this is, if you took like BA210 on campus, I don't know what it's called now, but I think that's it. This is the unique selling proposition. And you probably um, memorized it for a test and then forgot about it. But if you think about this in terms of your job search, it's absolutely appropriate. So you yourself are the product and you need to provide a specific benefit that's unique and compelling. So you need to be able to tell the folks that you're working with, like if you're coming into a teamwork situation in class, you know, you might be the person who's a great, um, like a simulator of information and you're really good at putting things together and making sure they flow. Maybe you're the person with the analytical skills. So what do you bring to that team? When you're interviewing, um, what would you bring to the company? So if you're working for a company called Young Brands, as an example, they're very focused on employee recognition. So if any of you have worked with volunteers across campus, um, you probably know that recognition of your volunteers is important. You can bring that to the table and talk about how you've put that into practice to increase the productivity of your um, teams at a time when you weren't able to pay them, right? Um, so it must be unique and it must be compelling. And I have kind of a silly example here, but way back in the day, we had an employer that asked a student 
um, about a time he tried something new. And his answer to that was, well, at one point I was really interested in interior design. And so I put my bed on the kitchen table in our apartment and slept there for a month. And I'm like, that's not compelling. You know, if you're, if you're an employer, what are you telling them? I get that he's tried something new and it was something that he found interesting for whatever bizarre reason. Um, but that's not really compelling to an employer. So in the case of, you know, my Yum Brands example, if you're bringing the unique ability to motivate volunteers who are essentially working for free by recognizing them in different unique ways, that's compelling to a company like Yum Brands. Um, and I apologize, Brian and I have been ships passing in the night lately, so we haven't really gotten together on this, but um, Brian, I'm just gonna ask if you have anything you wanna slide in here or if you wanna wait. Okay, that's fine, I got the head shake. <laughs> So if you're thinking about promotion of yourself as the product, right, the, the thing that the employer is going to purchase, we hope, um, you want to start in the classroom and you want to start in your student organizations or if you're working at Research Park in your offices there as part of your internship because these folks that are going to hire you um, are looking for you to make a difference in these areas. And a lot of them are alums and a lot of them are gonna reach out to their student advisors or their faculty members who they worked with when they were on campus. So you can kind of think, eh, I was a slacker in class, but they'll never know. Eh, they might know because I think a lot of times on campus, these alums reach back and they reach back to the very professors that you may have had and say, oh, we're excited about this candidate. What do you know? So you want them to say, you know, yes, even though it was a big class, I knew they were there. They, you know, made the effort. They participated in class. Their peers like them, whatever the situation is. And remember, every interaction is an opportunity. And I have a hundred of these examples, everything from an international student. And, you know, in human resources, companies don't sponsor international students. So we always have a struggle here but we had a student get on a cross country flight for a um, callback with a company. And she sat down by a guy and they started chatting and she played it just right with her branding and with her messaging to this guy. And by the time they got off the plane at the other end of the flight, she had an internship in the US. So, you know, I think uh, another example, um, GE, going back to them, used to have a fantastic Friday event. And it was almost like sorority or fraternity rush and all the candidates would come in and all the GE businesses would be there and you would preference, you know, what businesses you were interested in and they would preference. And one of our former students who graduated quite, quite a while ago, but we've become good friends um, was there and he stepped into the bathroom and we'll just say he was washing his hands. I don't know exactly what part of the bathroom visit this was, but another guy walked in and said, oh, I see you're here with Fantastic Friday. Yes, and they went back and forth and he said, well, you know, what do you think? What, what were you interested in? And my friend said, well, um, I'm really interested in um, GE Plastics. It flies a little bit under the radar, but you know, I've learned a lot of great things and it's an international business and this is really great. Guy in the bathroom was the hiring manager for GE Plastics. So this guy got hired into GE's rotational development program just because he was ready with his message, even though it was in the bathroom. So you just never know, I guess, is my message there. Um, you also have to think about your brand placement, right? Obviously, people like Brian, myself, the career center, your embedded career centers with your various um, colleges, um, they're going to be great resources and they're going to help you get in touch with alumni and companies who are out there. And at the U of I, you have an embarrassment of riches, to be honest, even with um, a tough job market, even with the uncertainty of the pandemic and is it remote, is it in person, do I have to move, what's going on? You know, companies don't cut their core schools, they cut those other schools. So we're not necessarily looking for new companies to come to the University of Illinois all the time, we're looking to hook up the right people with the right jobs. So your career center is gonna be great. 
Um, I think, you know, the first bullet point here, I hate things like icebreakers. I hate cheesy gimmicks, but you know, this was introduced to me years ago by a friend and I thought personal board of directors, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But if you think about it and you think about, this isn't a formalized, you know, you don't send out letters and have meetings and keep minutes, but you do have a personal board of directors. I have people on campus that I go to if I need to know, you know, how do I navigate these issues? Um, I have people that I go to in my employer um, base if I need to figure out how to navigate other issues. Um, honestly, my dad's retired, but I always still ask him some of these questions. So who are the people that you can go to for the various sets of issues that you have with your career development? figure out who those people are. Maybe a faculty member. It may be somebody like Brian or I who's in your college. Um, it you know, could be somebody at the Career Center, could be somebody in your student organization. And you know, use those folks to help you sound through some of your tough, um, tough questions and tough situations in your job search or developing yourself as a candidate. And I think I probably, you know, there's a whole separate presentation on this, but I can't say enough about networking and being a decent networker. You have to get out there. You have to talk about, you know, your candidate profile, obviously, and, and what interests you. And one of the best tricks of networking is to get the person you're talking to to talk about themselves, because you'll learn a lot. You don't have to come up with any answers and they'll feel like they've contributed. So I think that that's one piece, but don't go into networking always expecting a job. Go into networking expecting to find important information that will help you decide what may or even better may not be the right job or career for you. I think sometimes figuring out what the wrong decision is is more valuable than figuring out what the right decision is every single time. You learn a ton from mistakes. Um, national and regional organizations, you know, you've um, in a job like mine or Brian's, we belong to the National Association of Colleges and Employers, um, sometimes more helpful than others. But, you know, we're there and we attempt to be visible, present at conferences and things like that. Regional organizations, we've both been involved with leadership there. And then people start to call you as a subject matter expert and to give presentations and it sort of snowballs and you're really able to um, build your network there. And, you know, I, on the surface, I don't necessarily know what, you know, uh, Associate Director of Career Services at Ball State University is gonna do for me on the face of this, but once we're well networked, it may be that um, he has students that are good for my program, or I have an employer in Indiana that I've lost my contact with and I need to go. So being known as someone who can provide, you know, helpful information to my network will then pay me back down the road for sure. So I'm jumping here, but I wanna talk about your resume. And I just want to preface this by saying, because this is an important, it's, it's an ad for you, right? And this is the way, especially if you're using Handshake, that employers are going to um, use just to filter you in or out of their pile. So you want to do a good job with it. My main suggestion is you need to have a lot of people look at your resume. And if you ask 10 different people, you're going to hear essentially 10 different things, but you will begin to pick up themes. And those themes are what you need to key on. I suggest I don't require that my students use a personal profile on their resume because I have 80 candidates who are all very, very similar. So I need to put some way up at the top of this resume to give the employer a preview of what they're looking at and hopefully draw them in. So I suggest the profile to my students. May not make sense if you're an engineer. It might, this is, that is not my wheelhouse, but it's worth thought. So if you look at this, um, this is what, it's essentially the tagline for your ad, if the resume is an advertisement for you. And for this particular profile, um, I would say extroverted was an understatement for this particular candidate. 
Um, but he was very interesting. He did, um, uh, he owned his own detasseling business. And if any of you have ever detasseled corn or walked beans, it is quite possibly the most miserable summer job in the history of summer jobs. But it uh, is a great moneymaker. And he decided that he wanted to start his own company in high school. And he did it all the way through college and essentially went, well, and I'll show you here in a minute, but he's letting employers know that his unique benefit is that he, as a young, you know, 21 year old, um, was the owner of a successful small business. And so that's what they're pulling from this. And then all the pieces of the resume map to different parts of this profile that has hopefully drawn in the correct employer. So um, overall, your resume needs to, and your career people are, have already all told you this, but I'm just gonna throw it out there. It has to focus on accomplishments. It shouldn't just be a list of tasks because a list of tasks isn't going to map back to your brand. The accomplishments will, and we'll look at a piece of the resume for the guy that I just showed you with the profile. You always wanna to continue to improve. So if you, um, you know, we're interning at Research Park and you went to folks within your network there, then go to your embedded, um, if you're an LER student, come to us, go to your embedded career center and start to get those themes and improve on those themes. Um, I suggest, and the book is getting a little older now, but a guy named Brad Karsh wrote a book called Confessions of a Recruiting Director. And he is an advertiser by trade. He owns a company called JB Training Solutions now. But that particular book is the world's easiest read. And the first half of it is just tips about, you know, how you, how you position yourself. The second half, all samples of how he's updated resumes and cover letters. And a lot of his stuff is a little too salesy from my style but it does a great job of focusing on accomplishments and keeping you away from some of the big pitfalls and do's and don'ts of your resume. Um, and I would say Brian and I have looked at more resumes than we would care to admit this summer for our incoming fall class. And one of our biggest complaints is when people use templates. Um, it's a huge hassle. Um, you can't get your information back out of it. It's a problem. Um, and, you know, Microsoft kind of locks you into um, an irritating <laughs> template. So I would say don't do it. That's just my own pet peeve, though. So think about this is the guy for whom I showed you the profile just a little bit ago. Um, and I'm highlighting some things here, which I will show you. But and there's nothing. This is the before. And there is nothing wrong with what he's done here. It's giving, this is what he did. Um, you know, he threw in some numbers that have really quantified and that's nice. But if you think about it, you can really highlight accomplishments. So instead of just providing contract detasseling services, he founded the company with 10 employees and grew it to 78. So not just responsible for local payroll of 52,000, but revenue went from 4,000 to 25,000. I mean, he was a high school student and an undergrad. 25K in a summer is a pretty good chunk of change. And you can see from the dates on here, that's now been over a decade ago. So I've been using this example for a while, but it shows his payroll and it gives some of the extras that focus. And again, we're HR people that focus on the HR things that he did hired, um, retained, compensated, and supervised student employees. And this is made more impressive to the employers because these are his buddies, right? Like if you're a high school student, where do you find people to work for you? You go find your friends that you're pretty sure aren't deadbeats and you, you get them to come and, and to work for you. So again, nothing wrong with what's here, but that's essentially a list of tasks, right? And this elaborates into accomplishments. The other thing I'd like to point out, um, if you look here, I circled this at the last, he started originally with white management detasseling. No one has ever heard of white management detasseling. That's his last name, right? Like that's it. Start with owner manager because, and, and keep this consistent. So look at your resume and look at the experiences. If what you're hanging your hat on is going to be 
um, what company you work for. You have internships with companies like AbbVie or Honeywell or some of these other big names, then the company goes first. But in his case, owner manager is the most important thing that he wants them to, to think about. And your eye reads left to right. So you will look first at this title. So title, location, and dates all on one line. Um, and for some reason, this is just neither here nor there. I think a lot of people like spacing their date off to the, to the right. That's the least important thing. So I don't see any reason why you have to highlight it. That's just my own peeve. So we'll leave that there. But this helps to really support your brand. This guy is an entrepreneur. He can manage people. He knows how to grow, right? And he knows how to work a small business. That's it. No matter what his major is, that's going to be appealing to um, an employer. So I'm not going to spend much time on this, but if you ever have the chance to write a thank you note, always do it. And they're all gonna be electronic now. You almost never get anything in writing anymore, but make sure that you tailor it to the job, that you speak directly to the person who interviewed you um, and that you proofread it. Otherwise you end up with the wrong name, um, et cetera. If you're just you know, using the same letter over and over again. For the cover letter, I would say of all of the um, applications you'll put in on Handshake, probably, I don't know, Brian, what do you think? Like 10% ask for yeah. cover it's letters? Very, it's very not, few. It's not much. And my strong suspicion is that they do not actually read them, but you know that may be jaded of me. But you want to be sure that you're writing a different one for each job because, you know, if it says how excited you are to work for Pepsi and you've applied for a job with Boeing, they're going to know that you're just sending off applications as fast as you can and, and not really paying attention. Plus, the things that are going to make you attractive to Pepsi are not the same things that are going to make you attractive to Boeing. So you really want to be sure that you're tailoring that cover letter to a job and that you're supporting your brand that they will then be hopefully smacked in the face with when they read your resume. The line at the top is for my students, um, but I think big interview is available for everybody on campus now, Brian, is that true or is it just by college? Everybody gets it. it and if it's not through your college, it's through the Career Center. Um, can you tell them just a little bit about what that is? Yeah, so Big Interview is a virtual mock interviewing platform. So you can go on there and actually practice interviews. It'll ask you the question and then it records your answer so you can sit back and watch it. But what we do with our students is they actually come to us and all of our students before they go through recruitment in LAR will do a, a practice mock interview and then either Nell or I or or some others on our staff will actually review it and give them tips and pointers. But that's just one piece of big interview. Another aspect that I really like is, I mean, it's an educational tool as well. So they've got a lot of helpful videos on interviewing in different categories. Like there's a category on if you have prior military experience and how to incorporate that, which, which can be a struggle for, for military connected students. There's even one for students who are kind of more shy or introverted. So it actually talks about like how to sell yourself in that interview, right? To where you, you know, if, if you give three to five word answers all the time, you're not giving the employer anything. So it kind of helps those introverts kind of break out or the student who, you know, who doesn't, they feel like they're always bragging. So, you know, they always talk about what the team did and they're part of the team, but for an employer, they want to know what you did. They're not hiring the team. They're hiring you. So big interview can also like walk you through just maybe very specific things that you're dealing with in an interview. Um, but in LAR, I mean, we do it for the mocks and it's been really helpful because like last year, almost, I think a hundred percent of our interviews that were happening were virtual and virtual interviewing is different than in person. One thing that I noticed a lot with our students and it goes back to brand is 
in the in the big interview, they knew the question ahead of time, so they would write a script on how they wanted to give the answer. So instead of talking to the person on the other end of the camera, they just read off their screen. And it was the worst thing that I ever had to watch, just sitting there listening to somebody read something about themselves. It was very canned. And again, that's that's part of that brain. Like they did not come across to me as a strong candidate. So I mean, there's little things like that, like depending on the situation, like how you come across is extremely important. So I think Big Interview, since campus uh, offers it to any students, I mean, I don't feel like many students take advantage of it, but it's extremely helpful to, for you to see yourself and how you are kind of selling your brand, but also you could send it to, as Nell mentioned, your board of directors. So people that you trust, if you're not ready to like send it to a, you know, a career advisor um, or it's intimidating watching it yourself, but you can send it to, to anybody in an email and then they can watch it and give you pointers as well. And one thing here, I mean, this is a whole different presentation, right? Like we could talk about interviews for an hour or two hours or three hours, depending on what kind of workshop we were running. I think everybody knows what a behavioral interview is. Tell me about a time, you know, you really wanna prep for all of these, but what about an informational interview? So my biggest peeve is when a student comes to me, and I'll give you an example. A student came to me and asked for help with her job search and she, her part-time job was working at Penny's. And we had someone um, who was a vice president of HR at Penny's at the time. And I said, here's the person you wanna to talk to. And I guess this is on me because I didn't specifically say, go ready with questions. And it was dead silence on the line. She expected the person that she called to do all the work there. And I don't think you can do that. You need to know, all right, so this is my part-time job. Tell me more about how you use the degree that you have that I'm getting to go from a part-time job to this vice president job that you have. What are the experiences that you had? What, you know, I see from LinkedIn that you once worked for a consumer packaged good and now you're working retail. What are the differences? These are things that really don't take too much work to come up with, but you need to sit down with five or 10 questions ready to go. And you may not use them all, but rank order them and, you know, what's going to be most helpful to you. But I think that's the most overlooked. Everybody wants to talk about examples of their work. But if you're doing an informational interview, you want to be sure you pull them in and that you're able to find out the kind of information that's going to support your brand in the job search, the kinds of things you need to know to really be um, successful. Best case scenario, you impress them and you end up with a job, but at the very least, you want to come out of there with things that you want to do to improve your prep, whether it's the classes you're taking, the jobs you're finding or whatever. Um, all right, so case interviews, I'm not really going to talk a ton about this, but this is the one that's hard. I know they use them for HR. I know they use them for engineering. I know they use them for business. You just want to be able to work through a business scenario, prep for this, and there's not necessarily a wrong answer, um, but there are definitely wrong ways to approach this situation, and you just want to be prepared. So Google it. That's all I did. And companies like McKinsey, Bain, BCG are going to have tons and tons of resources on their site. But, you know, and this has nothing to do with your own personal branding other than the fact that you want your brand to reflect that you're prepared. And I think there are a lot of questions, um, you know, that are, that are surrounding case interviews and people get a little freaked out by it. So I just thought I'd mention it. Um, I think these days, online presence is huge. I think we've all seen examples from grownups of how not to conduct yourself online. And that's not a political statement. I think it's true across the spectrum. Um, if you're not already on LinkedIn, please be on LinkedIn. That's where you can have your resume that stretches for longer than a page. So if you've really done a lot, um, but you don't have space to put writing samples or examples of ads that you've done or more elaboration on different things that you've done. LinkedIn is the place to do it. And you can really um, add life to what's typically just on a one page resume. And they go and look for you there immediately. So if you're not already there, definitely go there. 
please be aware that on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, they will search you and they will find you. Um, and as you've known, I mean, um, you know, I think we saw an example last week of how uh, somebody lost their job with the Olympic Committee for some joke they made in a comedy routine in 1998. Like, there are people on this call that were not alive then, right? Like, this will follow you. So really think about this and think about the videos and the pictures and what you personally are posting. Um, and work on that if you hadn't given it thought up till now. And be very wary of private groups because those private groups, <coughs> excuse me, are not always as private as you think. People can screenshot, people can still share. And this last one, I've always just, um, this is a caution for my students, but I think if you're in the job search process, be very, very careful of how you share your offer information, how you share your salary or status. In our particular program, things can get competitive and people can feel bad if they're not getting offers and somebody else is like, I just got my sixth offer. And they're like, all right, well, I'm going to come kill you now. Um, you know, really stressed out and I don't want to hear this, but companies get very touchy about you sharing salary information online. And um, I think that is a case where I, you could have an offer rescinded. So just be smart about what you're sharing online. Um, obviously there's not a rock your profile next week. That is for our students, but be sure if you're on LinkedIn, this is where you show your brand. And if you're, you know, in addition to what you're normally, um, you know, showing, you want to have a professional, um, photograph, you want to have this information on there, but maybe your cover photograph, if your passion is travel is a cover photograph from where you've traveled. I think that's appropriate. It can be interesting and it can add some flavor to what you've done. My cover photograph um, on LinkedIn is a marching Illini shot, you know, because I'm, you know, dedicated to campus. I, I am a fan. Hopefully the marching Illini will have something to cheer about this year. We don't know, we'll see. Um, but you know, it gives that school flavor. So when employers are looking for me, that is always there. Um, and you can customize, you know, pretty much everything on there, including your URL so that you're easy to find. One thing you should know, this is a picture of the recruiter view on LinkedIn. Um, and if you have marked on your, I'm pointing at my screen like you can see, but if you have marked on your profile that you are open to new opportunities, they will see that you're open to new opportunities and recruiters do filter that way. So be sure that you've gone through and really done a good job of have, you know, filling out your profile. And that's true for Handshake as well. Um, Brian, I'm going to let you talk a little bit about Handshake. I don't have any screenshots there, but things that they should be doing that get overlooked maybe on Handshake. And the number one thing that we see is that you don't make your profile public or that your resume is public. So when a company is doing a search for students, like you're not popping up. And even if they've met you at a career fair or just kind of through word of mouth and they and they try to find you, then, then they can't. And a lot of times we'll have, at least in our case with our employers, like they'll reach out to us. And there's nothing career services can do like that. That privacy is, is set for you as the student, but that's probably the big thing. Like definitely get your profile. Like a lot of students will focus on LinkedIn, but again, there's a lot of activity happening on Handshake when you're in college. I think when you graduate, like then definitely hand, or LinkedIn is what you want. Handshake for alums isn't really as useful, um, but, but yeah, definitely make sure it's, it's public and your resume is public. And, you know, much like LinkedIn, it relies on artificial intelligence. So the more information you have in your profile and the more activity that you have in terms of searching jobs and applying for jobs, the system learns um, what, you know, what you like and what you want to see more of. And um, that will, you know, help the system to send you, in theory, more um, more job postings. I'm kind of hanging up here because I think of 
DSW where I've been a longtime customer and for some reason all their emails still show me like bright green Crocs and I'm like, what is it about my profile that is giving you the idea this is right? I think it just means I need to buy more shoes to make sure they know what I really like. So I'm going to go with that. Um, I think that, you know, this is really the last thing that that I have to say here, but if you read this um, this is the best note I have ever gotten from a summer manager. And it says great things about my intern. Um, although I have to be honest with you, I think it says more about this guy as a manager and I would want to work for him. Right. But he took the time to sit down because she did the things that she needed to do. She built her brand and then she followed through on that brand in her summer internship. And this is word for word, obviously, with um, information removed to protect the innocent, um, word for word what he wrote me. And it is the nicest note I've ever gotten. But I think if you, you know, set out to, to meet expectations and to, to um, use your band, brand to um, your advantage, then you could come through with something like this at the end. So this person wanted to know with there being seven to eight billion people in the world how can i offer something unique <laughs> i think you've covered that in a couple of ways but if there's anything else you want to add to that i mean i think you really need to um ponder that one through for yourself and i think brian mentioned this a little bit but it's easy to feel like you're bragging if you say that you've done something good and i don't think that's true i think you just want to be honest and talk about your accomplishments and there will be a lot of people that are similar and i think it's okay to be similar to someone else but you want to think about um you know if brian and i are both working with the same student we both bring different things to the table and think about what the things you bring to the table are. Um, it doesn't have to be unique as in never ever in the world heard of before, but out of the pool of students that they're looking at, are you the one, I mean, we had a guy a few years ago who was um, really quiet. I mean, he just literally blended into the background, super pale, super quiet, just really unassuming guy. His classmates loved him and they called him the godfather of statistics. And we have, as, an, as a required first semester class at LER, a grad level statistics class, not everyone loves it. I did not love it um, You know, when I went to grad school. This guy could sit down and go from kind of like wallflower to really um, you know, commanding the group and sharing great information and sharing that information. So if he came to me and said, I don't know what's special about me. What about this? Like anyone would take you on any group project anytime. And I have a lot of good friends that I don't necessarily want on group projects. So I think he's using that to his advantage. And now he's uh, in compensation with Chamberlain Group up by Chicago and, and keeps getting promoted. So it's clearly working for him. Awesome. Well, thanks. And yeah, anybody, Sorry. I just put down uh, my LinkedIn. You're welcome to connect. If you have questions, you can, it's just nellm at illinois.edu. I'm happy to answer questions or if anybody, if any professional staff members are on the line, we have an online version of our uh, successful on-ground program. But for students, if you're thinking about grad school, call us, call Brian. Brian loves phone calls.